And thank you, Professor Williams, for everything you do. Thank you, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, all of the researchers that we have here, University of Louisville, Murray State, Western Kentucky, UK. Uh, and thank you to the KYHIA for putting on now a several annual event, very educational, thank you. Uh, just to describe who I am, I have been working in hemp for about 28 years. I owned the first hemp store in the state of New York. I am the president of the Hemp Industries Association, the vice president of the U.S. Hemp Authority. Uh, I have a legal consulting firm, Hemp Base International. I sit on Normal's National Board of Directors, and it's my great honor to be the regulatory officer for Elixinol. So I wanted to give folks a little bit of a history. Where did the HIA come from? The HIA was formed in November of 1994 in Scottsdale, Arizona. We just had our 25th anniversary. Our 25th annual conference was held in Los Angeles to a sold out show. Uh, we really formed because we knew um, at the time we would need to separate ourselves. It's fascinating to separate ourselves, in fact, from cannabinoids and from extract. And, and here we are coming full circle again and embracing uh, extracts. But we uh, formed as a low THC oil and oil seed and fiber uh, trade association. So we then had our first president, Chris Conrad, and his wife, Nikki Norris, are still tremendous uh, activists and pioneers in all forms of cannabis based out of California. And we had these newsletters that we snail mailed to everybody. 1995, there was some internet, but not too much. Everything was snail mail at the time. In fact, we had an organization that assisted how we communicated with our members was through snail mail. So people would call, people would send mail and request, and we had some folks who would organize all of the messages that the HIA received, and they would print them out in table format and monthly mail them to all of our members, saying, as you can see at the top, your company may wish to respond to. And when I was granted this uh, archive, I was tickled a bit to find my own voicemail message uh, here in one of these from uh, April 5th of 1996, already a former hemp store owner at the time. Then we had, actually the HIA was quite instrumental in getting research started in Canada. Uh, did a lot of work with Health Canada to get that federal legalization in 1998. And here we see our, our first field day in 1999 uh, in Ontario. Now, when I say all our members, keep in mind that by 2014, we were up to 100 members. So from 1994 to 2014, our membership grew from zero to 100. <laughs> and then uh, we also had, at the time, um, our chapter program created farmer memberships we started in um, to, with the Farm Bill. We didn't have farmer memberships before then for kind of obvious reasons. And 2014 certainly changed that. In 2015, we doubled our membership in the course of that year, and that had our first conference, thank you Dr. David Williams, uh, in Kentucky, and got to actually see a real live hemp field of legal hemp growing in the United States of America. That was something tremendous that we were able to offer uh, the membership. By 2016, we grew to 300 members. We also filed an administrative petition with the DEA to remove hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. You may be shocked to know they have never responded to that petition, and now they're too late. Uh, we also had a conference in Colorado and embraced, truly for the first time, hemp extract. So and understand, there was actually quite an internal debate within the Hemp Industries Association where we had founders saying, hey listen, this is gonna be the takedown of the HIA. The whole reason why we formed the HIA was to prove to the DEA's Drug Diversion Control Unit that we would not divert extracts or cannabinoids and other properties of the, of the resinous parts of the plant into the illicit market. And you guys are starting to embrace hemp extracts and we think that's gonna be the downfall of the HIA. Well, after a great internal debate, the decision of course was made to embrace extracts and thank goodness we have. Uh, and we certainly hope that hemp extracts, not only uh, is it garnering so much attention for hemp because people are experiencing relief with pains and aches and other conditions, um, but it's also helping to generate the revenue that we uh, will fund what we call the trillion dollar industries in hemp fiber, oil seed and fiber and all of those applications and of course all of the planetary healing aspects of replacing uh, synthetic counterparts with uh, our natural biomass.
Oh, and let me just continue that by 2017, we had 500 members and we sued the DEA for the third time. We'll get into a little bit about the four times that we have sued the DEA. Uh, and then by 2018, our membership grew. In fact, what went from 500, it, we say 1,000, but the reality is that by the end of December, we had about 1,200 members. So it is just blowing up, guys. Uh, hemp is here. And we are here to serve our members and to galvanize and to be a unified voice. You'll learn more about our coalition partners as well. I wonder if there's a way to maybe get a little water. If anyone could grab me some water. I'm sorry about that. I usually have it up here. I don't know if someone's sick, I'll drink that. Uh, thank you, guys. So let me talk a little bit about the federal legal update here. So, for the first time in 81 years, we have amended the definition of marijuana within the Controlled Substances Act. Now, while the Controlled Substances Act did take place and was enacted in 1970, the reality is that the Nixon administration did not change a single word from the definition of marijuana from the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. They kept everything uh, intact. So 81 years later, we have this amended definition. It's so fascinating to me that I, I work with a lot of attorneys. Um, I am an expert witness and a legal consultant, so my bailiwick is in hemp law and policy. And many marijuana or cannabis attorneys in the adult use and medical markets do not realize that this definition has changed. And as we can see now, thank you so much, sir. Thank you very kindly. Uh, and as we can see now, it says the term marijuana does not include hemp as defined in Section 297 of the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1946. Hemp has reclaimed its rightful place in the broad light of day with all of the other agricultural commodities in the United States of America and is no longer defined in the Controlled Substances Act. It is now defined where it belongs in the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1946. And what is interesting, of course, is this year we dropped the word industrial at the federal level. So now we're just hemp, which is great because we definitely used industrial and, and not hid behind that word, but used it as a shield and an armor. We're industrial hemp. We're for industrial purposes. And I'm very glad that we're now getting to a point, even at the federal legislative le level, where our federal legislative heroes say, listen, we can dump the industrial now. We, industrial hemp uh, doesn't necessarily sound so great or have great optics with, with items that are for human ingestion. So we like that it's just hemp. And I have in there, in red font, the expansion of the definition. Uh, as I like to say, even the definition of hemp in the 2014 Farm Bill, frankly, was very clear. It said, any part of the plant cannabis sativa L, whether growing or not, that does not contain greater than 0.3% THC on a dry weight basis. So I often say, if I gave a plant to a four-year-old and said, you can play with any part of that plant, and then said, what part of that plant can't you play with? The four-year-old would say, I can play with any part of that plant. And we would say, you're right, that's absolutely right. But you give that same hemp plant to a DEA agent, up until recently and say, you can play with any part of that plant. What part of that plant can't you play with? And they would respond, the flowering tops, the leaves, and the resins. And you would say, no, there is no such exception in the, in the definition. So our federal legislative heroes expanded the definition to make it clear to the DEA, who apparently was not as intelligent as the four-year-old, who seemed to understand what any part of the plant meant. And so now we are saying, we including the seeds, the compounds, extracts, derivatives, salts, isomers of salt, the whole bailiwick, and this is a wonderful thing for the hemp extract industry. Now, as you learned from Commissioner Quarles today, and aren't you blessed to have Commissioner Quarles, if we could clone him and put him in all 50 states, believe me, we would. And same would have been true with uh, Jamie Comer as well. So as you learn from him, we're still going to be operating under these agricultural pilot programs from the 2014 Farm Bill until the USDA files its uh, regulations. And then a year after it files its federal leg regulations, the Farm Bill from 2014 will be entirely repealed and it will become obsolete. So what else did the Agriculture Improvement Act of 2018 do? And that is the long title or the official title for what we call the 2018 Farm Bill. And the key points of it are not only that it expanded that definition, and that was major, expanded and removed hemp entirely, but it included the tribes. The 2014 Farm Bill neglected to include the tribes, so that's wonderful that we've uh, um, included them. 
It authorizes and funds hemp research as part of the Supplemental and Alternative Crop uh, Program and the Critical Agricultural Materials Act. Our federal legislators knew they had had bills in every year annually. In the House, in fact, there had been something called the Industrial Hemp Farming Act filed every year since 2013, uh, 2005. And in the Senate, the Industrial Hemp Farming Act filed every, to every year in the Senate since 2013. I will say that a lot of folks think Mitch McConnell came in at the end for hemp, but the reality is he was one of five unpopular co-sponsors from the very first iteration of the Industrial Hemp Farming Act in 2013. He'd been a co-sponsor every single year. But all that that act did was define hemp and remove it from the Controlled Substances Act. And after four years of seeing the unrolling or the unveiling of uh, the 2014 Farm Bill, they came to realize we can't just amend the Controlled Substances Act, we're gonna have to amend a bunch of acts, such as the Federal Crop Insurance Act, which is another thing that the Farm Bill does, and those same programs regarding supplemental and alternative crops and critical agricultural materials. So keep in mind, we have how many farmers in the room? Could I have a show of hands? So you folks know how important crop insurance is. I mean, how can you get into this business? And thank you for everyone who has risked uh, putting those seeds in the ground without insurance. In Canada, where they federally regulated circa 1998, they were allowed crop insurance right off the bat. And Canada very quickly became the world's leader and the number one importer or exporter uh, to the United States for bulk hemp food ingredients and processing. But again, federal crop insurance was a huge part of them being able to accomplish that. So this was very key, and those, uh, those legislative heroes are so important because they did that. As Commissioner Quarles told you, it does require the USDA to create those federal regulations. Um, there is a provision in this bill that will not allow drug felons to participate in the program. Uh, this is unfortunate because the drug war has uh, disparately and, and disproportionately affected minorities and people of color, and we do see that as a continuation um, of that unfair and discriminatory treatment. But the reality is also, uh, that it was a bargain that was made because we had uh, Grassley, who was the head of the Judiciary Committee, who wanted to really gut our new definition of hemp. So I think that these, um, these deals were made. One good thing that happened at the end, the HIA did put forth its comment. We're so grateful to uh, Senator McConnell and all of the supporters of that bill, but we did have to say, gee, we were supporting everything until the drug felony ban was entered. So we did make a, a public comment about that. Um, and there was some benefit to that because they added an amendment to the amendment which allows folks who do have a drug felony conviction um, but are already participating under licensed agricultural pilot programs the ability to be grandfathered in to uh, new state commercial and federal programs. However, new drug felonies, that will not be acceptable. Uh, also, nothing in the act uh, will uh, affect the FDA's authority, and they proactively said that. We always knew once the DEA would be removed from hemp, that the FDA would be there waiting for us. And indeed, we need quality assurance, food safety, dietary supplement safety, uh, pharmaceutical safety, so uh, we're, we're now working with the FDA a bit, and we'll get into that in a moment. Um, and also, states are not supposed to interfere with the interstate transport of hemp. We've already had two load seeds, uh, Idaho is saying, yay for you, Farm Bill, but Idaho disagrees with that, and Idaho doesn't care that we're not supposed to be intervening, and we're going to seize the hemp, which they have. Uh, it's already been into federal court. The folks who got their shipment of, of biomass uh, seized have lost the case. Having said that, we are appealing to the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And, and all of this stuff, ultimately, will be tested in court. Because while we know what the legal issues and the legal status are, the reality is that the guys and the gals with the guns and the badges and the boots on the ground don't know. And they're confused and they're being put in an interesting position when uh, hemp has a similar terpene profile, therefore it smells like other forms of cannabis. It can look like other forms of cannabis and it's simply difficult after all of the social engineering and prohibition and taboo around cannabis for them to wrap their heads around the fact that it could possibly be legal for a semi-truck of any form of cannabis to just be driving down the highways and the byways of the USA. But welcome to the world. That's what's up, everybody. 
Now, on that same day, December 20th, uh, the commissioner for the Food and Drug Administration, Commissioner Gottlieb, released a statement and said, for the first time, he repeated what we had already known. A lot of folks didn't realize that the FDA had come out with this position almost four years ago on their FAQ marijuana page, where it has said for nearly four years, is it legal to, uh, to market CBD products? They don't differentiate, and this is important, between CBD as an isolated molecule and hemp extract as a botanical extract, a full spectrum extract. But they say, hey, is, is it legal for CBD to be transported across state lines? No. Is it legal to add CBD to a food? No. Is it legal to market CBD as a dietary supplement? No. They have always said that for the last four years because of this Epidiolex, um, which by the way is different from Elixinol. Epidiolex is a pharmaceutical drug uh, produced by GW Pharmaceuticals and under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, when a company puts forth a new drug application, um, even if it's a new dietary ingredient or an investigational new drug, NDI and IND are the uh, acronyms for those, once that happens under the act, no one is allowed to market that same substance as a dietary supplement or a food. So C Commissioner Gottlieb comes out on December 20th, reiterates what we've already known all these years, but says something very encouraging for those who actually bother to read the entire statement. People are a bit lazy, they read the first two paragraphs and then go off on their uh, tangents, but had they bothered to read all the way down, it got pretty encouraging where Commissioner Gottlieb uh, says for the first time that the agency is using its authority, considering using its authority to basically make an exception to its own rule because under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, they have the authority to break their own rules. Now, uh, and then of course they said with conditions. They want to be able to make pathways for hemp extract companies, for CBD companies, to be able to market their products as dietary supplements and food. Um, so that's fascinating that they're going to do a public hearing. We now have just learned in April to get stakeholder input because twice this week, once at a public hearing, uh, and once at a conference where Commissioner Gottlieb spoke, he reiterated what I'm telling you, which is we're going to consider using our authority to make an exception, allow these, these uh, products to be sold as dietary supplements or food additives with conditions. What does that mean? That's where the devil is in those details. Conditions, of course, will, will mean a concentration of CBD. So uh, maybe this much concentration level for a food additive, this much concentration level for a dietary supplement, and this much concentration level for a pharmaceutical product. That's where we're gonna be watching, guys, because of course, we want to be able to keep marketing our dietary supplements. Many companies are, are selling 1,000, 3,000 milligram um, uh, tincture bottles and uh, capsules, all forms, and we want to still be able to do that. So we'll be looking into those um, details. It was just announced this week that the public hearing will be in uh, April, so that's very encouraging. Additionally, Something else happened on the 20th, it, and I'm discovering over the years here that what happens in federal legislative land is it's like cannabis day. So everything about hemp will happen on one day. And so that is also for the first time in the history of the United States that the FDA uh, granted GROSS status. GROSS is the acronym for generally recognized as safe. For the first time to a hemp foods company, it's actually fresh foods, uh, fresh hemp foods that was granted the grass status, but fresh hemp foods owns uh, Manitoba Harvest and Hemp Oil Canada. Um, and they were granted grass status for their full line of whole hemp seeds, hemp seed oil, and hemp protein powder. Now that is wonderful for the entire industry uh, that that occurred. Be careful, lots of different states are passing legislation um, saying that food products and grain products for hemp will be allowed to sold in their state if they have received grass status. So I've been writing to these different states saying, well, that would make it so that only a Canadian company would be legal in your state, and I'm sure that's not what you intend. So for New York, uh, there is a, and, and I'm based out of New York, there is a caveat that it's uh, 
grant, has been granted grass status as defined by the New York State Department of Agriculture. And I think it's very important if for those of you who are watching state legislation to make sure those qualifiers are there so that we don't make it, God bless Manitoba Harvest and Hemp Oil Canada, they've actually done incredible things for our movement globally um, and nationally. Both of those folks have, have been board members for the HIA in the past, but we can't make it that they're the only legal product in our state when we are sitting here growing U.S. hemp and building the U.S. hemp economy. So those are the details that are very important. Now, what does the hemp industry think, particularly the hemp extract industry think, with regard to these limitations and these um, statements and positions by the uh, FDA that state it is, they boldly stated, it is a violation of federal law to market CBD as a dietary supplement or a food additive. So why are we still doing it? Why has the industry then be, been allowed to grow to this extent? It's because statements made by the FDA, FAQ pages and press releases put out by the FDA, and the mere 19 warning letters that have been issued by the FDA to CBD and hemp extract companies since February of 2015, it's been four years, they've only issued 19 warning letters and those were for making medical claims which you're not allowed to do, but those letters never resulted in corrective action, they never resulted in a cease and desist, they were mere warning letters. And what we say about all of the things that I just mentioned is, none of those are final agency actions. They are statements, they are warning letters, they are press releases, they are not the law, and they are not final agency actions. In fact, if a hemp extract company went to go sue uh, the FDA right now, they would be, their case would be dismissed right off the bat because the FDA would say, you haven't exhausted your administrative remedies, none of these are final agency actions. So that's why. Uh, why hasn't there been more enforcement? Not a lot of public harm here. And the only public harm that we can see are in synthetic cannabinoids and in consumer fraud and exploitation. And we will get into that in a moment. And that is when we have substances that are marketed as CBD or having a certain content of CBD or hemp extract, but those products actually don't have uh, those properties in the bottle. It's not fair and it's against the law. Let's now talk for a moment about just some market data and some industry updates here for that. We can see the highlights. 2018 market data is forthcoming. We just don't have that yet, guys. So we, we are only going up to 2017 right now, although we get into the crop report. I can come more up to uh, speed. But you can see the increases here, and then we were up to $820 million in the United States last year. Keep in mind, the United States is the number one importer of raw hemp materials and manufactured hemp goods in the world. World. We can see, of course, that CBD took the largest part of that pie, then personal care, then industrial applications, and oddly food uh, had moved down to fourth place. I should also state, and let me see if we're going to get into that, nope, um, that the hemp food market, however, is slated to grow as, at a compound annual growth rate of about 24% between now and uh, 2022. Why? Gluten sensitivity, celiac sprue, as you may know, uh, hemp is a non-gluten, it's a gluten-free uh, grain. Also an increase in consciousness for veganism and vegetarianism, but we expect that uh, market to grow. I could spend 10 minutes talking about the superior nutritional value of this true superfood. We hear a lot about superfoods, but hemp grain, deserves a super cape. It is such a superfood, the highest digestible form of protein in the entire plant and animal kingdom and a tremendous source of essential fatty acids. What are essential fatty acids? We must have them. They're essential for our body and brain functioning and we don't make them in our bodies. We have to get them from food. So let's look now also at the US acreage that has increased, as you can see, we have exponentially moved forward here. Now, this 2018 number, it's 78,179 acres. Just keep in mind that a few of those, Kentucky and many states, actually track the amount of hemp that was not just permitted to grow, but that actually grew. And in fact, Kentucky even tracks. They're fastidious and a real shining example for how to work uh, and, and collect data for these agricultural pilot programs. They also track what was actually harvested. Some of these states do not track what was actually harvested, only what was permitted to grow. And that 78,000 plus number includes just over 10 million square feet of indoor greenhouse. So let's look at who our top producers were out of the 23 states that grew this year. 
Um, it was Colorado, then Montana, then Oregon, then Kentucky, then Tennessee. Those were our top five uh, producers. And we'll see if I'd like to fit New York on that list next year, and we'll see if we can't get Kentucky up there a little higher. It's amazing uh, that 42,000 acres of hemp have been permitted to grow for the 2019 growing season. And as Commissioner Quarles uh, stated, probably about half that will end up growing, but that is a tremendous amount of acreage. 41 states with hemp laws, nine to go. Uh, so a lot of folks are, have been saying, you know, hemp is now legal in all 50 states. The reality is that hemp is federally legal. That does not necessarily translate into hemp being legal in all 50 states. It's just not. There are nine states with no hemp laws at all, and there are multiple states that have hemp laws, but they're flawed in different directions, and certainly there are states that have overtly uh, tried to make CBD not illegal in those states, but they put CBD in with their medical marijuana programs. They've defined CBD as things like low THC oil and put them in a definition that brings them outside of legal hemp, which of course we know contains not greater than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. And some states require a medical marijuana authorization card in order to be able to legally possess or distribute um, a CBD, hemp extract. So we need to work on all of that. So as I mentioned, uh, I am the vice president also of the U.S. Hemp Authority, the HIA, uh, does all of the training for the first certification seal in hemp for current good manufacturing practices, current good manufacturing practices, and good agricultural practices. We're on version 1.0. We are working on version 2.0, and actually at Natural Products Expo West next week in Anaheim on Monday, we're having a, and there will be a, a public comment period for 30 days after that, where we're seeking comments from everybody in the industry, as we did with our first version, on how we can improve uh, version 2.0. But this is a certification seal and program that has been uh, devised to make it recognizable to the consumer and law enforcement that your product is safe, it's quality assured, and that it is legal hemp and not other forms of cannabis. So this is a program to show consumers and to show law enforcement that the product is safe, quality assured, and that it is legal. Now the HIA does the training for this program, we are the training partner for uh, the U.S. Hemp Authority, which is why the HIA has a board seat uh, for the U.S. Hemp Authority. And our training programs basically go through what the audit entails to help folks become prepared for uh, that audit. We, the third party audits, by the way, are conducted by a company called Where Food Comes From. Uh, they're the nation's really leading service provider in these certification programs. And of course, they also do these well-established third party programs for certified organic and the non-GMO project and so on and so forth. So uh, the auditors will come out to either your farm and they do need, by the way, to inspect your farm if you're going for a grower seal while the biomass is actually growing, not after it was harvested or before it is planted. Uh, and they will also do your processing or manufacturing facility as well. I want to talk a little bit about HIA member benefits. Uh, there are so very many of them, and usually a little bit closer to my podium here, but we are the nation's brain trust for industrial hemp, and really the window to the international expertise. After a quarter of a century, the, the relationships that we have developed around the world are very valuable and growing all the time. Um, we're a first line of defense. We have sued the DEA four times. Many folks don't realize that in 2001, just want to make sure I'm doing well on time, yes, I think, yes I am, I have till four, thank you, um, that in 2001, the DEA put forth interim uh, and interpretive rules that were going to make hemp seeds, non-viable hemp seeds meant for human consumption and hemp seed oil, Schedule One controlled substances. They actually put forth a rule to do that. And the HIA, along with Dr. Bronner's, uh, Nutiva, and others, other private plaintiffs, sued the DEA, won in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The DEA then filed a motion for reconsideration, essentially, and we had to go back to the well again, and we won again. But we got those Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals judges to say, listen, there was an exception to, for hemp, in the definition of marijuana, and any naturally occurring THC 
within what were then the exempt parts of the plant, meaning the mature stalks and the non-viable seeds, any naturally occurring THC within those two parts of the plant are free game and they are free to go. And the HIA and our uh, plaintiff members were able basically to save the entire hemp food industry and allow it to continue to be nurtured for the American consumer, retailer, distributor, wholesaler, and importer. We also sued the DEA for its marijuana extract rule, including hemp extract within its definition of marijuana extract last year. While we did not win that case, we got a very favorable piece of that case in our favor, which said, hey, uh, the Farm Bill compliant extract is not subject to the Controlled Substances Act. We got 29 federal legislators uh, to draft an amicus brief, and one of them was your own Senator Rand Paul. We had three senators and the rest were Congress people from the House um, that stated what the legislative intent was. And the fact that the Farm Bill of 2014 said, notwithstanding the Controlled Substances Act, that how the, the Farm Bill starts out, that legitimacy of industrial hemp research, which is the amendment, within the 2014 Farm Bill, and the federal legislators wrote themselves in an amicus brief, amicus is Latin for friend of the court, to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and said, listen, when we said notwithstanding the Controlled Substances Act, we meant not subject to the Controlled Substances Act, and we absolutely intended every part of the plant, including cannabinoids, extract, compounds, derivatives, and the like. We also then, for the fourth time, had to sue the DEA, because guess what? They still had their press release from 2001 stating that non-viable hemp seeds and hemp seed oil meant for human consumption were Schedule I controlled substances. That press release was still online. It was online until we reached a settlement in May of 2018 and they finally took it offline. And what was happening was departments of ag, probably including the Kentucky Department of Ag, were, ha were then being tasked with unrolling these agricultural pilot programs, and they're Googling like everybody else. These poor folks have this beautiful opportunity to reintroduce this versatile, valuable crop, but they don't understand the complexities of it. So they're Googling, are, is hemp grain legal? Is hemp seed food legal? And what was the number one Google result? The 2001 press release from the DEA saying, no, it's a Schedule One substance. So then folks like me were getting calls from the departments of ag going, wait, we thought it was legal, you can buy it at Costco, but according to this 2001 press release, it's not legal. So we actually had to sue them again, and we did that in the form of a motion for order to show cause as to why the DEA should not be held in contempt for the 2004 order requiring them to leave us alone and leave the hemp food industry alone. Uh, the HIA facilitates what has been called Hemp History Week, and what will probably evolve into a different uh, title, but will still be absolutely focused every year that same year. It's an annual retailer educational and grassroots activism uh, program. And last year, there were 280 community events across the country uh, in just that week. And it generates a tremendous amount of revenue for the hemp industry. And it's, it's fantastically educational for the consumer at these retail outlets um, to have uh, this Hemp History Week. We are the training partner for the U.S. Hemp Authority, and there are discounts to those trainings and discounts to the annual HIA Con, our big annual event when you become a member as well. Um, there are various other members only discounts. As a member, you're allowed to give discounts to other members and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a public relations team to educate regarding the benefits and growth of the hemp industry. We have a well-trafficked online directory. I think it is probably the most well-trafficked hemp directory on the planet. Uh, that exposure opportunity is very important. Opportunities to display your products at HIA events. Opportunities to be a speaker at HIA events. Opportunities uh, to be eligible to participate on committees and task forces. Additionally, we have third-party announcements uh, where member companies are allowed to make an announcement and it is then pushed through our entire network. You can also apply to be a featured member of the month and we can also even reshare and repost uh, your Facebook messages throughout our very large social media network which includes Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Now, of course, we reserve the right to not repost your, uh, your uh, message if it doesn't, if it is inaccurate or it doesn't comply with the law. Um, also, we have a members only content portion of our website. Now, for those of you who haven't explored the website, if you are not logged in, 
you, the members only portion is invisible to you. So you have to actually log in at thehia.org and you will see uh, this members only content appear. That's only accessible to our members and we now have a new general counsel who is going to help us build even more robust content. There's an entire new website coming as a matter of fact. So what is the bright future of the HIA? Ongoing coalition efforts. In fact, we have signed a memorandum of understanding with our coalition partners, Vote Hemp, the US Hemp Roundtable, the American Herbal Products Association, uh, and we often do joint letters to the FDA, to various state departments of health, it's state departments of health and public health that seem to be coming in with this idea that CBD is illegal and wanting to take them off the shelves. Um, we have additional partners as well, uh, the Authority, the Farming Alliance, and the Drug Policy Alliance. We're working with the USDA with our coalition partners. We have uh, regular meetings with them over the phone so that we can be a part of this process. Um, we have an international presence at the World Health Organization and United Nations level as well. We're participating in ASTM, which many of you may know has started the D37 Cannabis Committee to create standards. Uh, for all of the hemp industry, every aspect of the hemp industry, but they're starting pretty slow and ASTM could use a lot more people uh, to become involved in that process. If you're interested, uh, please Google ASTM D37. It's only $75 to be a member and, and we need all of these voices and, and your participation at that level. As I mentioned, new general counsel to really help uh, put more robust information. I'm having trouble with my bank, I'm having trouble with Facebook, as Commissioner Quarles said, and then we ha would have a sample letter for you to be able to send. Uh, committees and task forces are being unleashed. We're only going to unleash about three at a time, so watch out for those uh, opportunities. Those are with an application. Uh, obviously, Hemp History Week is moving forward. It, Hemp History Week was great. We wanted to explain to people that America has actually this very rich history. Because keep in mind, our government did not just want to remove the plant from our consciousness, they wanted to remove all knowledge of the plant from our consciousness. We have just formed the Hemp Industries Foundation. Uh, that Form 1023 is being um, uh, processed. And that will be for a legal defense fund, publications, and education. Uh, the Hemp Feed Coalition is something we're very proud of. Ms. Annie Rouse, are you in here? She's probably out there. Ms. Annie Rouse and some incredible activists, um, hemp activists who are getting uh, various species one at a time. I think we're starting with cats and dogs because we get to do one application fee for those two animals because we don't consume them as humans to allow uh, hemp food and hemp feed to be uh, approved for agricultural, for agricultural feed. Right now it's actually not, not for pets and not for any species. So we're working on that through the Hemp Feed Coalition. Uh, Strategic partnerships and event participation, we're constantly building those relationships and, and uh, educating. And again, we have that new website coming. I will end by saying, if you are not already a member of the HIA, it is free to join the KYHIA. And we don't have chapters in every state, one of our most robust chapters, and I believe our first one, uh, is here in Kentucky, obviously a very strong chapter. When you join the HIA at the national level, the membership application will give you, uh, ask you if you want to join a chapter, and that, again, is totally free. So go to joinhemp.org uh, to plug in. And thank you. And the best thing to remember, and what I've been saying since I started in with this, is how can we really promote the hemp economy? We can buy hemp, create that consumer demand, make that choice. We vote every day with our dollars, guys. Bye, Hemp. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, KYHIA, for everything you do.